Yeshiva for two years. I went to Yeshiva University for undergrad and to Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary, where I studied for rabbinic ordination. Believe it or not, I did not always know I wanted to be a rabbi professionally. I had a wonderful rabbi in Yeshiva University, including Rabbi Michal Rosenzweig, Rameer Tversky, and many others. But during my years in undergraduate, I also majored in accounting. And while learning for smicha, I was able to pass the four CPA examinations to keep my options open. During my last year of university, I met my Besher Tehuva, who began her second year of medical school during our first year of marriage. Baruch Hashem, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. When Tehuva finished medical school, a long time later, we both very much wanted her to get a Shomer Shabbat residency program in pediatrics. Luckily, she did and she placed in Westchester Medical Center in New York. Additionally, during that time, we were blessed with our Bechorah Miriam, you may have seen her before. You may also recognize her from various Shari Shemayim Zooms. I know she's a fan favorite. We were therefore limited in terms of where we could live and given the limited job opportunities, we chose to pursue a position as an accountant and part of the finance department for a watch company that specialized in e-commerce in Williamsburg, New York. Those were challenging years. Huva was a working absurd hours. We had a newborn and I was commuting to Williamsburg every day from Washington Heights. That's a lot of subway time. Baruch Hashem, with Hashem's help, support from our family and some perseverance, we made it through. I did enjoy my job working for that watch company, but I still felt that there was something missing. I can never fully insert myself into the goal of maintaining the books and analyzing financial statements so that a company could sell more watches, a perfectly legitimate goal, but one I was just not passionate about. After about a year and a half of the company, one of my rebbeim reached out to me with a job opportunity to teach in Rambam Masifta, a yeshiva high school in Lawrence, New York. After that, I was offered a more full-time position as a rebbe in North Shore Hebrew Academy High School in Great Neck, where I taught for two years. At the end of the second year, I saw an opening to be Skan Rosh Beit Midrash, a Beit Midrash Zichron Zov, Rabbi Mordechai Torchiner's amazing organization here in Toronto. Baruch Hashem, I was lucky enough to secure that position and work for the past two years or so. I have been able to learn and teach throughout the community and specifically serve as the rabbinic assistant for Shari Shemayim, which has been an incredible honor and privilege, which brings us to today. I'd like to share a brief Devar Torah with you, which will help me express the way I view and hope to fulfill my role as an assistant rabbi in the Shari Shemaim community. This past Shabbat we read Parshat Korah, which describes the story of Korah's rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu and Haaron HaKohen, the high priest. Now, putting aside Korah's true motivations, Korah actually makes a pretty strong claim. He tells Moshe, kulam kedoshim Hashem. The whole assembly is holy, and Hashem is among them. Why do you raise yourself above God's congregation? At first glance, we can relate to Korach's assertion. Certainly, we do believe that we were each imbued with Kiddushah, with sanctity. As the Torah reiterates numerous times, Ki am kadosh And we certainly believe that Hashem dwells among our people. So why is Korach wrong? Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the Chorol of Rahan, his covenant conversation published this past week, suggests that in his claim, you have raised yourself above the congregation of Hashem, Korach fundamentally misunderstood the concept of leadership. For the leader in the Jewish community does not raise himself above the congregation. Rather, Jewish leaders are charged with delving deeply into the needs of the people. Rabbi Sachs notes that the ancient ziggurats, the Near East, and the pyramids of Egypt were broad-based and narrow at the top. This represented the hierarchy of the ancient world. The laboring masses at the bottom served the elites at the top. Not so in the Torah community, which is depicted by the Minorah, an inverted pyramid, narrow at the base and broad at the top. The appointed leaders of our community are there to serve not to be served. In fact, as Rabbi Sachs notes, the only person with an explicit commandment from the Torah to live with humility is the Jewish king. Listen to how the Rambam articulates the appropriate behavior for a Jewish monarch in the Laws of Kings, chapter two, law six. Says the Rambam, he must be merciful and compassionate to both the small and the great with concern for their needs and welfare. 
he must show respect for even the lowest of the low. This is because in Rabbi Sachs' words, those who serve do not lift themselves up high, they lift other people high. I certainly would not compare myself in any way to Moshe Rabbeinu, but I aspire to live by this philosophy of servant leadership. As your assistant rabbi, I hope to develop connections with each and every member of the community. Hoob and I would like to be there for you whenever, not only for those extraordinary moments, but even during the normal moments of life as well. Please feel free to reach out during the ups, downs, and even when you feel like you're somewhere in the middle. And yes, while we are young, we are still learning, but we hope to grow along with you as we do our best to serve every member of the special Share Shemayim community. Let me close with a few thank yous. First, I would like to thank Hashem for bringing my family and I to this community, an important era of our lives. Thank you to President Robin Gofein, Louis Vandersloos, Zahava Stadler, and everyone else who was involved in arranging tonight's event. Thank you to Rabbi Strauchler and Rebbe Tanavital for being there for us and allowing us to learn from you. Thank you to Rabbi Jesse and Mrs. Lauren Shore for your friendship while you were here modeling what an assistant rabbinic couple looks like. Thank you to Rabbi Elliot and Ms. Rochelle Diamond. We look forward to serving this community in the coming months and years together. Thank you to Rabbi Mordechai Tarchiner for bringing us to Toronto and allowing us to be part of this community. Thank you to our parents and our family for always supporting us and taking care of us from childhood until today. We look forward, please God, to welcoming you to Toronto very soon. We just have to keep the tabs on the quarantine situation. Anyone who has any um, pull there, greatly appreciated. And finally, thank you to all of you, everyone on the Zoom call and to the entire community for inviting us to be part of the wonderful home that is Sha'are Shamayim. Bezrat Hashem, we look forward to greeting each of you personally soon and to sharing in many wonderful smacho together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bergman, Rabbi Bergman. Um, my name is Zahava Stadler. I'm a member of the board here at Shari Shemayim and uh, a member of the religious committee as well. Um, and I also have, I think, the unique distinction in the shul of being the only other person from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, so I've, I've known Rabbi Bergman a little bit for a long time. Um, and uh, feel his pain with the border quarantine situation and seeing family, for sure. Um, so I have been charged with the task of uh, leading the interview portion here so that the community can get a chance to know Rabbi Bergman a little bit better on a personal level. Um, I'm also going to flag right at the top here that after this official interview portion, there's also going to be a uh, Q&A open mic for the community. So if anybody has a question on their mind for Rabbi Bergman, uh, get it ready. We're gonna be getting there and feel free to chat it either to the whole group or to me personally, um, if, it, if the inspiration strikes you as we go along. Um, and I'll be moderating that question and answer after we're done with this, uh, with this opening kickoff interview. Um, so I'm gonna get started here uh, by at the risk of, I don't know, fishing for compliments, um, asking, because unlike most brand new members of Shul clergy, Rabbi Bergman, you've had the opportunity to really get to know the Shul over the course of your time as rabbinic assistant in Shari Shemayim. So you have a leg up. So at the risk of fishing for compliments on behalf of the community, I do want to ask, what's something that's really struck you about the Shul since you've joined? Because you've really had an opportunity to see that. Thanks for that question. What struck me maybe most deeply is the combination of diversity, unity, and commitment to the shul. Shara Shemayim is such a large community and so diverse. People of all different ages and backgrounds come from all different places. And yet, um, especially you could feel this when um, shul was more open and people would freely congregate and socialize together, which I do hope happens again very soon. You get the sense that everybody looks out for each other. Everybody's there for each other in difficult times. Um, with uh, with uh, uh, whether it's on Purim, we're sending Mishalach Mano to the people who've lost someone the past year, um, in just so many ways. And everybody feels so committed to Shara Shemaim that, that regardless of a person, people's different backgrounds or ages, I just feel like you talk to people and they feel passionate 
And this feeling of belonging in the Sari Shamayim community. And I think that's something really special where you have so many different people who are so diverse, but still feel this sort of unity and commitment to the greater good of the community. That's one thing that strikes me. So I'd love to get uh, a little bit specific about the experiences that you've been having in the shul so far and, and ask you, because it's been in lots of ways a challenging time for many people, but, um, but you've spent the bulk of your time as rabbinic assistant uh, in COVID, right? So there, there is sort of no normal for the job that you've been having. Um, so what's been a challenge during your time as rabbinic assistant that's given you the opportunity to learn and grow as a rabbi? So I, I would sort of describe the last year and a half with another Kopen uh, per vote where the Mishnah says, in a, in, a, in a place where no one else is available, you've got to step up to the plate. And I feel like that's sort of been a part of my experience the last uh, month and a half um, because we've had different trying circumstances and we need as much help as we can have. And that sort of puts you in a position to sort of take a stand where you might not have otherwise and sort of live up to a certain role. Um, so for instance, during the Yom Narayim and Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, because we had so many different minyanim that were running at the same time simultaneously um, this past year, it was, uh, it was quite a scene. And I essentially had the task of running my own minyan and, and presiding over the services and leading the davening and speaking and doing yiskor, which are all very new things to me and um, allowed me to have an experience I just wouldn't have had otherwise. And I found that very meaningful and formative. Um, additionally, um, there was a time this past year when Rabbi Sharfer was away and um, I essentially was tasked with, again, running all the minyanim in shul and speaking on Shabbat and trying the best as I can to fill in that role. Um, and so there have been all sorts of opportunities where I've had to sort of just whether or not I felt I was ready for the role or I felt I wasn't ready for the role, it was time to step up to the plate and do the best that I could to, um, to fill that role. And it even meant things like delivering Masaf Manu or, or Matuna Labionim from the shul um, to people who really need it, which was something that I had never done before, or um, being more involved with Shiva Minyanim or with um, bar mitzvahs or, or things like that. And, and that's really been a meaningful and, and very valuable experience for me. And, and certainly I would say that um, as, as for all Jewish educators of the past year, the ability to get accustomed to things like Zoom or virtual experiences or running a Zoom during shul or teaching over Zoom, um, finding different ways to connect community members and we can't necessarily meet consistently has been a, a challenge that um, I try my best to adapt to. Yeah, we are, I think, all working on becoming big adapters this year. Um, and, you know, during the course of this time, you've been involved in dozens upon dozens of programs that have taken place, uh, you know, <laughs> rather unusually. Right, this may not be the most conventional rabbinic experience, but I'm curious if you can uh, point out what's been your favorite event so far, or a particular program that's really shown for you as as part of your Shari Shemayim experience thus far. So well, that's a, that's a difficult question for me to answer because I definitely would pr uh, I would say that I'm the type of person that likes to do a lot of different sort of things with different sorts of people. So one thing that I think is a unique opportunity in Shari Shemayim that I mentioned and that I sort of pride myself on is the ability to interact with people of different age groups, which sort of bridge the spectrum. And um, I, I think that over the, over the course of the last few months, I've had the opportunity to have specific programs which fit certain age groups. So for instance, where Shaffler mentioned earlier, um, parent-child learning, uh, PCL, which is a really wonderful program where um, young children and parents would meet on Motei Shabbat together and usually there's pizza and we, I would come up with different um, Torah activities or learning programs for them to take part in. And then at the end, there's a speech and then they would get prizes. It's a really wonderful, safe, happy space. And um, over the course of the pandemic, when obviously gathering together in person and having pizza together wasn't going to happen. So Ari Karen, who is a wonderful youth director and I were sort of talking back and forth about whether or not um, it would be feasible to, to continue to carry on parent-child learning 
um, when we couldn't gather together. And, and the truth is, at first, I thought that no, I don't think it's going to work because Zoom just doesn't doesn't cut it in terms of it's the whole atmosphere and the aura of being together is really part of the sort of the, the thrill of it. But as time went on, and you know, at being someone with, with with young children myself, sort of there was this huge gap on what stage stuff. So and people really were thirsting for opportunities to get together. We said we'd give it a try, and Ari was really great in terms of. Um, coordinating, getting prizes and the pizza delivery and different worksheets that I would print out and getting them to all the people. We broke it down to a pretty um, efficient system. And in, in fact, we had it for a number of weeks, a number of months where after Shabbos, um, you know, get, get, we gave people some time to get to the shul and gather everything, go back to their houses. And, and I would say I'm, I'm pretty, I'm proud of the fact that we created a really wonderful space and happy time for people and families after Shabbos to just gather together and enjoy each other's company, even if it's over a Zoom, and to learn with one another. And I think that was a really wonderful opportunity. Um, I would also mention that um, in the Shari Shemaim community specifically, and also um, in the greater Toronto community, there are a number of university students who are thirsty for, again, interaction and connection and Torah learning. And I've had the opportunity over these last few months to teach both this year to some of the university women. It's a Talmud share on Thursday night. Um, and also to, um, to university men, a Parsha share on Fridays. Um, the teens, I, uh, I, there are some wonderful teens in the Shari Shemaim community. Um, actually, some of them are moving to Israel soon, but there are a number of who are just bar mitzvah. And, and I have had the opportunity to join them when they had their team in Yonim. For um, this past Shavuot night, um, we were able to organize a way in which the teens could safely gather together, and we stayed up all night learning together on Shavuot, and um, and we got food, and it was really wonderful. It was just a wonderful experience, and we were able to relax with one another, and also to uh, to learn together. And um, um, I would also say that um, again, mentioning the sort of the phenomenon of Zoom Shurim, that over the past year and a half. Um, I've been giving a Wednesday night shiur, Wednesday night class, which is generally attended by some of the more senior members of the, um, of the congregation. And I think we really built up a good crowd. I think people really looked forward to it. We had some great discussions and topics. The first year was on Rebbe Sheet. The second one has been on religious Zionism. And I think that it helped to really sort of fill a need for people during the course of their week. Um, and, and I'll also just mention for, for some of the younger kids, we once had a Ask the Doctor, Ask the Rabbi program where kids who just had questions about the pandemic, whether medical or halachic or hashkafic, um, had a time to ask us those questions. And I thought that was also very, um, a very wonderful and successful program. Um, so sorry to sort of ignore your, your request to pick one. I'm not very good at, at doing that sort of thing. Um, but I, I think that I'm very happy and proud of all of those different programs and learning opportunities. Well, with that, I, I think it's, it's maybe a good moment to step a little bit outside your shul experience because we're, we're getting such a strong sense of that side of your life and, and hear a little bit more about you uh, outside the shul building um, bef before and during this time. So um, I'd love to ask, tell us a little bit about your hobbies or you know, what's, how do you spend your time when you're uh, not busy teaching people about Zionism and Gemara? Okay, excellent question. Um, so uh, I, I would say that I would mention two specific hobbies. Um, I'm a very musical person. I've always liked to sing. Um, and I'm an amateur guitarist. I, I'm hoping to get lessons at some point soon in my life. Maybe you've uh, heard some of my guitar, some of the people on Zoom. Don't, don't tell me what you think of it. <laughs> but, um, but hopefully gets the job done. But uh, I really like music. And I'm also, I've also enjoyed uh, playing the sport of basketball for my whole life. I'm a big avid basketball fan. Also a big Yankees fan, um, happens to be. Uh, not looking so good right now, but in fact, I think my father is on the Zoom call. We have a video somewhere in the, in, in, in the Bergen archives of my reaction to 1996 New York Yankees World Series win. Um, <laughs> sort of interviewed me. Um, but um, so yeah, I, like to, I like to run around, I like to play. Um, one, one thing that sort of people that grew up with me know is that I was on the basketball team when we were growing up um, and also in high school. And I'm not gonna say I was the most talented on the team, 
but, um, but I did my best. And sort of at the end of the game, um, if we were winning by a lot, there, there, would, uh, there would be a big chance in the stands to, for the coach to let me in the game. In fact, there's another uh, interesting thing about me, which my parents are on this call. I still don't have a good answer to this question, but, but for my whole life, I've been called Sammy. That's, that's, that's always been the way people refer to me. My even name is Shmuel. Happens to be that my legal English name is Steven. Now, why I've always been called Sammy, I do not have a good explanation for. I've heard a number of answers to this question. None of them has satisfied me. Uh, maybe if someone wants uh, from the audience wants to come up with a good suggestion as to why that's so, um, I'd love to hear it. Um, so when I was uh, sitting there on the bench and, and the crowd wanted to get me into the game, they would uh, they would chant Steve Machine. That was uh, that was the chant that they would. Uh, and uh, they, were, they ended up making a machine it, like a robot that they wheeled back and forth in the sideline. It was it was it was quite humorous uh, <laughs> at the at the time. Um, so yeah, and uh, I, I like to exercise, I like to run around, I like to play sports. And I I would say generally like. Uh, I like to have fun. I like to uh, I like to go to amusement parks. I love roller coasters. Um, yeah, I'm generally I generally like to have fun. So that's a bit about myself. Do you want you want to say something about yourself, Luba? Or maybe not. Sorry, I'm putting on the spot over here. That's my fault. Okay. Rewind, rewind. Let's cut that from the script. All right. <laughs> Well, we're going to turn to community questions in just a few minutes. So just a reminder to anybody who wants to chat in a question. We already have uh, a few waiting to go. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to close uh, with a question that I'm stealing from one of the podcasts that I listen to um, and ask you to uh, give us three books that you'd recommend that have been important to you or influenced you in some way or another over the years. Okay, so just um, proviso, we, we agreed that we could do one sort of a gag joke book. Um, so we're, we're going to include one of those. And of course, I refer to the very gripping tale of the essence of humanity and what does it mean to be human and to grapple with the human condition. Of course, I refer to um, The Number Leaf, very, very important fundamental book, which in which the protagonists uh, live in a world without names and without color but there are only numbers. And they have a quest to bring out color and meaning and depth in life. So I definitely recommend that one. And, and I would even say that there's a movie in that book. There is, there is a movie there. And uh, if anyone has connections, go for it. The number leads. It's going to be a great movie. I think there might be, a, maybe there's a, maybe, okay, I don't know. Check the copyright on, on that. Um, but it's a really great book, happens to be. Um, so some more, I guess, adult, adult books. One of my favorite novels, one of the classics is The Count of, Monte Cristo by uh, Alexander Dumas. Um, a really gripping tale that I just couldn't put down when I read it. And it's just my favorite sort of um, historical fiction. Um, it really gets at human emotions and the power of revenge. Um, and you know, at the end of the book, he's almost done with his revenge and he sort of like can't even do it. And he himself feels devastated about that. Um, so that's one of my favorite historical fiction books. And then you know, it's hard to just pick one book in terms of, you know, rabbinic thought, but I'll, I'll choose the, a book by the rate by Norman Lamb, um, which is about Torah Lishma, um, which is all about what it, why we learn Torah, which is a very fundamental question um, that he asks. And he's, I, I thought it was sort of opened up my eyes to the breadth and depth of Jewish thought, because he sort of goes through different differences between sort of the Hasidic Kashkafa, which is more mystical, and, and then the less Hasidic Kashkafa, and it gets the questions of, um, you know, what, what are the meaning, uh, what's the meaning of learning Torah? What's the meaning of doing mitzvot? Why do we do them? Why are they important to us? And how much are we sort of looking for an emotional connection to God? How much do we say like, you know what, emotional connections are nice, but we're just going to focus on the, the bread and butter and the text in front of us. Um, so those, if I had to just choose three, which was the question, and this time I'm going to stick to three, um, those are three books that I would recommend to anyone who uh, is looking for some uh, good reading material. So now I'm going to uh, turn to our community chat. So people have been sending me a couple of different questions. So uh, first I'm going to ask on behalf of the Moses, um, how has your experience at Zichron Dov prepared you for this new rabbinic role? Um, 
It's a great question. I well, aside from aside from my experience in the shul, um, which I spoke to before, um, I would say that Bim Midrasha from Do puts you in a lot of different situations. A lot of very, it's a very broad audiences. So I've given shirim in um, conservative shuls with people who can't assume any sort of background. Um, I've you know run kumzitzes. We did a tubishvat seder. Um, I've learned with high school students. Um, and the other thing I would say is that one of the things, if you know Rabbi Torchiner, and you should, uh, you should get to know him. He's really a wonderful person. Is he is so wonderful. I think the emphasis on professionalism, emphasis on one of his um, classes and source sheets and anything is just so, um, well prepared and organized and fashioned in such a way that anybody can access the information he's trying to give over and he's always sensitive to people's time and he's just always so considerate in everything that he does and it really to me taught me about the ethic of true professionalism in teaching Torah and trying to impact the community um, and I would also say that um, Working with Rabbi Herchiner, there's a certain emphasis on, you know, on, on on time and and making the most of your time. And I think that that's something that's really important to um, being a rabbi of the community, where you have so many different things thrown at you at once. Where it could be being in a, like I just had this week, being involved in a shiva and then you know a wedding and things like that. That you sort of have to really be careful about time management and how you um, delineate time for certain activities and certain responsibilities. Um, so I've learned so much from my routine and I've had a lot of opportunities to meet this community and meet different, and, and also I would say to experience different communities, um, which is one thing that I, I'm very grateful for before stepping into this specific wonderful shul, you know, getting the chance to visit other schools like the Bayit and um, just other schools throughout the community. I'm sorry, the Thila and, um, and B'nai Torah and the Far Cell Jewish Center and really just going around and seeing how different shuls operate and meeting the, the, the Rabbanim of, of those shuls and getting a chance to get to know them and how they operate is just a very wonderful educational experience for me. So we have a, a question here from our immediate past president, Randall Craig, who wants to know what's one thing that scares you about the role that you're embarking upon? Scares me. No, um, I'd say the most, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, I'm politically correct here. Um, being a rabbi of a shul is hard, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> it's quite a large community, Baruch Hashem, and there are a lot, it's very diverse, and many people need many different things. And, you know, I'll, I'll sort of quote what I, Rabbi, Rabbi Strassler mentioned before, which is that um, the notion that Shigagat Talmud Ola Zadon, which means that a person makes a mistake in their learning, it causes Zadon. It's almost like a purposeful sin. And some of the first shame the commentators explain that when somebody asks you a question, if, if you're not careful in the way that you study the answer to that question, you give them an answer that's not appropriate. So the mistake that they make is really your responsibility. And that's really quite a tremendous responsibility to not just in terms of literal questions, but to try to fill a role in people's lives and to, to be a rabbinic leader and trying to guide them, um, it's just very presumptuous and it's, it's quite a responsibility. Um, and so I, I would say that I hope to Hashem and hope to do my best and act the same Shemayim and hope I can continue to, uh, to fill that role for, for the community, for everyone who needs it and to be there for everyone. But it's quite a responsibility, one I don't take, I certainly don't take lightly. It's worth noting that many of the Jewish leaders, including Moshe Rabbeinu himself, when asked to lead the Jewish people, refused numerous times because of that responsibility, because they took it seriously. And I certainly do also take it seriously. Um, and I, uh, I acknowledge my youth and, you know, I'm still young and I'm still learning and, and it's a lot uh, to take on. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and confident that I'll do my best to, to do so. So we have a, a question. I'm going to call on Joyce Rifkin to ask her question, and I'll note she's on the Zoom as number one Red Sox fan. So I'm going to ask her in advance to not hold your Yankee fandom against you. Um, <laughs> but Joyce, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. 
I, I was actually going to mention that if you look at my stage name, my alias, and anybody who knows me reasonably well or even a little knows that I am a big Red Sox fan, but I am prepared in your case to take a step back and give you a chance on your own to maybe forget that you are a Red Sox fan, you are a Yankee fan. Wait, maybe wait, you'll wait. come over, to, you'll leave the dark side and come over to the to the other side. Anyway, I also wanted to thank you because I know as uh, having young kids, this time is really, it's, it's a difficult time. I know when my kids were little, bedtime, I would call it the witching hour. So I, we really, I think everybody here appreciates your taking this time to speak to all of us. So you actually mentioned yourself that Cherish Mine is a diverse community, diverse in many ways in interest and in ages um, and in religious, um, religious feelings. But what I would really like to ask you is, you know, there's, there's a segment of the community that I feel has been neglected. And I think it's, um, I don't wanna call them senior sing singles. I'm not talking about gray haired people like me, but kids who are single, who are in their, and they're not kids, who are in their late thirties and forties. And I think we have um, a number of them. And do you have any ideas how to reach out to this group? It's a great question. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, you're, you make a great point. Um, I think it's unfortunately, not just in our community, but in many communities, oh, sure. um, without, without referring, trying to think about the best way to refer to that group, um, some of the people who are not married beyond the years that some people expect people to be married, I'll say it that way, I mean, whether okay. that's a fair expectation or not, um, mm. is, is a different story. But um, but they, they 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 sometimes do feel that you know they sort of sort of fall to the wayside. And I think it's a real real challenge. Um, I, I think that um, over the course of this year and a half, it's been challenging. But um, I do think that as things begin to open up, I'll have an opportunity to first of all just reach out. Um, I'd like to just to call a few of them and talk to them and, and just to sort of say I'm here and, and, and to strategize together with them um, in terms of how we can get together. Specifically, um, some, some ideas I've been thinking about in terms of like programs, I think you know we should strategize based on the time of year. Um, I was talking to who about this and I know that maybe there might be some regulations against um, sort of registering and securing permits for parks, but. I think it would be really nice to have um, picnics, like a, like a community picnic at the park. Um, Cause I feel like people love to get together and outside and you know, you sort of go to a park and you're thinking like, okay, maybe someone will be there, maybe not. But what if we had sort of an organized initiative where, you know, I think that's a sort of thing that is flexible such that um, different um, parts of the community, different demographics can use the park as they see fit. We can have, you know, a learning session, we can have just sort of, you know, a place to eat, we can have, you know, get games for kids, and then maybe we can, you know, have a place um, for the younger singles to just like together, and um, we could um, organize activities for them specifically. I mean, uh, there, there's all sorts of them. I would, I, I would say that I would try to be sensitive to not see this necessarily as like a mixing and matching type of activity where they feel like, oh, we're here to marry you off. Like I, that wouldn't be my emphasis. It would be more just an opportunity for people to get together and have a good time with one another. Um, and I would say another time slot target after after it's no longer nice outside, which uh, unfortunately happens here in uh, here in Canada for a great portion of the year, is uh, is Motzei Shabbat. Uh, maybe hopefully as as uh, the time goes by and things begin to open up, I think. Motzei Shabbat is a really wonderful time to target. Um, it could be something as simple as going bowling together, frankly. Um, yeah. Or, but I think we should try to, I think the first thing, it starts with developing connections and reaching out to them, not in a condescending way, but I wanna reach out to everybody and make that clear, um, but also to them. And hopefully we can get a group together and begin building from that. Okay, thank you. So as we wind down, I uh, I believe I should be tossing it back to Rabbi here to moderate the next stage. Absolutely. So we're going to turn now to Rabbi Diamond to share some brachot with Rabbi Bergman as well. 
Rabbi Diamond, please come up with mute and share brachot. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Does God smile? I'm not really sure. Maybe, obviously, physically not, but I'm pretty sure that in a metaphoric sense, he's smiling tonight. Uh, 45 years ago, I spent a year in a yeshiva in Israel where I had the opportunity to meet a bunch of wonderful people. Uh, one of them and I kept in touch intermittently throughout that period of time. Um, this person became a doctor in the States, and his name is Dr. Michael Bergman. It's Rav Sammy's father. So here we are, a circle has sort of connected between 45 years ago meeting Rav Sammy's dad, and now I have the opportunity to work with Rav Sammy at Shul, uh, and I'm very excited about that, very excited about that. By the way, uh, Rabbi Bergman, you've mentioned, and other people have mentioned your age, your youthfulness. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's going to pass, so don't worry about it. I don't think you're going to be stuck there forever. Um, you know, the official title that Rabbi Bergman has in the shul is assistant rabbi. And, and I understand the word is assistant in relation, of course, to the, to the senior rav at the shul. Right now is Rabbi Strohler. Um Suffixes and prefixes matter. So I'm going to suggest that more important than the suffix, the A-N-T, at the word assistant rabbi, I'm going to prefer saying you are an assisting rabbi, because I think that really is the job of any teacher, any rab, is to be an assisting individual to all the people he comes in contact with, whether they be seniors, as Joyce was asking, whether it be the youth of the shul with whom you've already begun working, or whether it's any member of the shul, regardless of age, just an interest to sort of make a connection. And you've demonstrated so powerfully just how much you love doing that. I once heard a, a lovely idea, and I'm going to end with this. Every day when we dub in the Amidah, every day, we say, we turn to God and we say, Ata Rav Lehoshia, you God, you're abundant in helping. I once heard someone say, the job of the rabbi are those three words, but you just have to pause a little bit differently. Ata Rav Lehoshia. Your responsibility is a rub is to find the way to help whoever needs your assistance, whether it's spiritual, emotional, some guidance, just someone to talk to, some to know that there's a face, a friendly face, a family like the Bergman family to whom I can turn if I want to be grounded, if I want to be connected. So my words to you, Rav Sammy and Dr. Ahuva, as you now transition into a formal position of assisting Rabbi at Sher Shemaim is, may all your efforts, may all your kochot, may all your talents, may all your passion, the both of you, individually and as a family, be used to make our connection to Hashem, to our shul, to each other, and to the Jewish people deeper, stronger, more exciting, and more vibrant. I look forward to working with you. Chazak ve'amatz. Amen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Rabbi Diamond, um, for your remarks, and thank you, Rabbi Strockler. Um, and also, um, thank you, Zahava, for your wonderful interview and for organizing the program this evening. Before we close, I'm going to call upon our Gabbai, our um, member of the executive and co-chair of our religious <laughs> committee, Dr. Louis Vandersloos, to say a few closing words. Thank you, Robin. What a wonderful evening. Kola uh, First of all, I'd like to thank Zahava Stadler for organizing this special evening for Rabbi and Dr. Huwa Bergman and family. Zahava, your many talents and attention to detail are a great asset to our shul, particularly in your capacity as member of the Religious Committee and Board of Governors. Although you, you and your family have only been members for a few years, you have already con contributed so much to our shul. Thank you also to Robin, Rabbi Strachler and Rabbi Diamond for your valuable contributions to this evening's celebration. You have both helped to make this evening special in your own meaningful ways. Tonight, we had the opportunity to congratulate Rabbi Bergman on his new position as assistant rabbi. And it was wonderful to get to know the Bergmans a little bit better, share stories and good wishes, 
and hear thought-provoking Divrei Torah. On a personal note, I've had the privilege of getting to know Rabbi Bergman during the almost two years that he has served as rabbinic assistant in our shul. Although the pandemic has made it difficult to get to know Ahuva and the children, prior to COVID-19, Miriam was one of my loyal customers in shul when it came to drinking the grape juice for Kiddush on Friday night. I look forward to the day when Miriam, Devorah, and all the other children can participate again in bringing in Shabbat in this very sweet way. Rabbi Bergman, I've enjoyed your Divrei Torah, your thought-provoking shiurim between Mincha and Marev on Shabbat, and your talent for reading the Torah and leading services. You've been a big part of Shar Shemaim long before becoming our new assistant rabbi. Back in January, when Rabbi Strachler mentioned that you were applying for the position of assistant rabbi at the Bayit, we thought maybe now is the time for Shar Shemaim to also consider hiring an assistant rabbi after having put the idea on the back burner during the COVID-19 pandemic. Normally, this would involve the formation of an assistant rabbi search committee and it would be a long drawn out affair, but why go through a broad search during these extraordinary times when we had among us such a wonderful ex and excellent young rabbi already working in our shul who would be a perfect fit. Rabbi Bergman, you are someone who has contributed so much to our community. You are well-liked, you are recognized as a gifted teacher and spiritual leader and all around nice guy. I asked you if you would be interested in being considered for the position and you were very enthusiastic in that prospect. I asked for your patience as we still needed to go through the process of executive approval, fulsome discussions and approval at the religious committee and finally a thorough presentation and discussion at the board. Following approval at the board, which was a no brainer, it was with great joy that we proudly announced to the shul that you'd become our new assistant rabbi. Rabbi Bar Bergman, in you we see a leader that has the potential to maintain ongoing excellence and one who can create a positive and productive environment in our shul. During the transition period between when, when Rabbi Strother leaves to assume his new position at Renat Yisrael and the hiring of a new senior rabbi here, we are confident that with you working as our assistant rabbi, along with Rabbi Diamond as interim senior rabbi, our members will be in great hands. We look forward to watching you shine bright as the rising star that you are, both now and in the future. Thank you for all, all of you for attending this evening and welcoming the Bergmans to our community. We, are, we all look forward to the end of this pandemic, God willing soon, and being able to greet the Bergmans in person in our wonderful shul. Mazel tov, Rabbi Bergman. Thank you all. Thank you, Louis. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome. Good night. Bye. Welcome. Welcome. Bye bye. Good luck, Louis. Good to everyone. Well, what a beautiful show, Paul. Mazel Tov, Rabbi Sammy. Wonderful to see you and wonderful to meet Ahuba. Thank you, Saul. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Mazel Tov, Shep. Rabbi Bergman. Thank you, Chazel Freund. Thank you so much. You. Looking Thank forward you. to working together. Yeah. Mine, mine, mine. Please, God. Everybody, bye.